we're going to get going. Uh, my name is Travis Chase. I, uh, as I said, I'm the team architect for web applications. The control panel team is what we call them um, for Endurance International, the Bluehost division. And and I run the uh, the web applications team. We actually have a couple of different groups, and we're trying to build uh, enterprise versions of both internal as well as external applications. And we've had a chance to play with Node over the last year and learned a lot. We don't consider ourselves experts by any means, but we thought we'd share what we've learned. You can find a copy of the slides um, here if you'd like to follow along. We'll also show those at the end, so if you uh, don't pull that up fast enough, you can still grab it. Quick way to do it, just go to slides.com, search for Mark and Node.js. That's how I do it. <laughs> So what is it? Why do we want to use it? Uh, Node is based on Chrome's V8 engine, which is a very slick, fast JavaScript engine. If you've used a Chrome browser, you've technically used V8. It's, it's just that awesome. <coughs> um, as I just said, it's a fast dynamic interpreter for the language. Another thing that's really cool about Node is it has really slick I.O. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about the event loop and about also how it handles I.O. So I'll get into that more. But one of the selling points I think of Node, uh, besides concurrency, is, is that uh, the way that you handle I.O. asynchronously, of course, um, is very easy, straightforward, and uh, you can just pick up and go. This is a cool little thing that we found on Google Trends. So this is since uh, 2010. And this is just showing popularity of Node.js in terms of a search term. So you'll see we also have Ruby, Python, and PHP here. So Node, yeah, the interest is steadily increasing, and with very good reason. The, um I don't know how many of you are familiar with Forrester Research. They tend to focus more on enterprise, um, enterprise IT. And they recently published a study that talked about how there's a huge transformation going on right now from Java, not necessarily leaving Java altogether, but more and more moving to Node.js. Now the interesting thing about this shift is that enterprise IT tend to be very, very conservative. I've spent a lot of my career actually creating software that was targeted at enterprise organizations. And uh, they're probably the most conservative. Startups can jump on new platforms like that, no problem. But when an enterprise moves to a platform, it's got to be rock solid. And so they're not going to do that unless there's you know, a reason to. Let me uh, give you a case study. Uh, there's actually a great talk that was done at Fluent uh, just a month or so ago by one of the senior guys at PayPal. He had actually just come over from Netflix about 18 months earlier. And um, he basically wanted to start a pilot project. Almost all their stuff was built in Java, their back-end stuff. And said, so, hey, let's, let's try a pilot, see if we can get this thing uh, on Node, and let's see if there's any benefit. The interesting thing is they only put two guys on this thing compared to a team of 12. Um, and basically started them both at the same time. Well, the, the Node guys finished first. They created uh, the same functionality in significantly less code. It was more rock solid, easier to maintain, um, kind of blew everyone away. And um, they also found that Node was awesome for kind of experimenting and trying things out before they went uh, and started creating a production system. They have now switched just in the last 18 months, and this is as of a month or so ago, they now have 67 Node.js projects going on at PayPal. That's pretty amazing. In fact, they, they have, uh, eat, they have uh, they drink and drank the uh, Node Kool-Aid so much that they've created an open source project called Kraken.js. Um, it's actually worth looking at. You might want to Google that at some point. Kraken.js has got four specific modules in it, uh, one of which is pretty cool is their application security. 
Another uh, case study was a talk I heard last fall given by a gentleman at Walmart. And uh, what they found was that at, on Black Friday, they were seeing such a huge spike in traffic that they needed to figure out a way. How can we you know, try to manage this thing? So they decided to go to Node. And um, they moved all their, Node, their web servers over to Node. And uh, lo and behold, last um, Black Friday, they found that it uh, worked great, handled it without a hitch. And they have now doubled their Node.js development staff. This is as of last fall, from 40 to 80 developers. So these are two significant um, use cases. There's also quite a few other companies, big enterprises, that have made the move to Node. So this isn't a, um, you know, the thing with JavaScript frameworks there, you know, there's almost a new one every year. Uh, but I think Node is clearly been proven to be a rock solid platform. And um, my future prediction is that there'll be a Node.js track at OpenWest in the future, just for Node. It's that significant. Some of the enterprise guys, I just pulled off a couple of quotes. What they're saying is that it's fast, it's very easy to develop to, and um, they're, they're getting around a lot of the uh, concurrency and locking problems that they experienced in the past. Things you want to use Node for. Of course, ideally, your fast, scalable, real-time applications. WebSockets. Node is very WebSockets friendly. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Essentially, the idea that you can communicate bidirectionally between your server and your client is fantastic. No more polling. Instead, your server can tell your client what's going on. As I said, bidirectionally. So two-way communication. Yes, you can still, of course, do your standard AJAX request. You want to pull something, fine. But with WebSockets, you have another le uh, layer of, of communication. And you can do both. So here's some top use cases we found. Creating REST APIs, obviously a very big one. Real-time services. Once again, con concurrency you know, is key. You want to be able to get as many users in there and process them as fast as possible. Microservices, some tooling, computational heavy uh, operations. I'll talk a little bit more about this when you come to the event loop, but if you're using Node, you're not going to want something heavy in, when you're running your applications in there. Send that off to something else, wait for it, get it back. But it's not something you want Node to handle because they're trying to handle requests concurrently. And here's some sample applications. A chat server. We were talking about Socket.io a minute ago. Perfect for this. We're actually going to show an example of this here. Um, APIs on top of an object store like MongoDB. MongoDB is a, a, a type of database. Uh, very useful for um, relation, not necessarily relational data, but if you've ever used JSON, you know your JSON, JSON structure. You've got your keys, you've got your values. MongoDB is like putting JSON in a database. It really is just that simple. You're reading your, your data in that manner. Uh, queuing inputs to a database. So this is great for um, live statistics, analytics. Uh, it can work as a server-side proxy like Nginx, so you can proxy it to other things, which, once again, with the whole um, computational issue, you might want to be proxying, proxying some of those requests onto other things. Um, this is something that um, we've been very interested in and are working towards develop, and that is just uh, using it as a stack for development. So on the back end, we have a node stack. We, anybody, of course, can just get that, of course, with the appropriate access, and get that from the repo, pull that up, and then they start developing on the single page app. We use a build process get out the, the client-side server page app, and then any of our consumers can just have that client-side part that we've built. So then we have things like we can you know, process SaaS, we can uglify all of our JavaScript. So when we're done, we have this self-contained, very nice client-side JavaScript app that we can just give out. It's fantastic. And then there's just prototyping, because it's 
very easy to spin up something in Node, like a web server, a file server, any other kind of server, uh, you can start testing client-server interaction. Um, another cool thing about Node, technically, is you can write command line stuff in it if you want to. Don't even worry about client-server stuff. You can treat it like a glue script now, just Node, Space, JavaScript, and it'll do things. There's even core modules for doing things like that. What not to use Node for? Uh, back to the calculation intensive operations. Uh, don't want to use it for that. Uh, I put, I left this one up here. This is less true now. Uh, a couple years ago, there wasn't as much support for your relational databases like MySQL, Postgres, etc. But you'll find NPM modules, like there's even one that's MySQL node. It's a pure JavaScript driver for MySQL. So feel free to use it for relational databases. Yes, Mongo is a great purpose, uh, great use of Node. It's, it's got great following, great support. Um, it really fits because of the whole J JSON model thing. But if you're used to working in MySQL, go for it. And then, if you're trying to do something a little bit more synchronous, Node may not be your cup of tea. Node is asynchronous. What you're doing in it is asynchronous. It's about the event. I'm going to talk about that more in a minute, but keep that in mind. Node is asynchronous, whereas in, if you want to do something like build some sort of standalone binary application, something much more synchronous, or even in there you have your own devices, whatever, Node's probably not going to be it. You're still serving something. You're still interpreting something. And here it is. Here's our, our Node architecture. So we have our users, and they're making requests. Here's our node server. Nerd, no, node has one main event loop, uh, event loop that handles all the requests. That's where the concurrency comes in. It runs on a single thread. It's one of the reasons why computation isn't necessarily a good idea, idea on Node, because you could slow down all the other requests that are happening. And then, if it has to do anything I.O. related, we were talking about how cool it is with I.O., it does throw off separate threads for that using libEIO, which essentially does POSIX uh, requests out. So you need to get something from a file like a JSON config file or load a file like an image file, whatever. That's fine. Send, uh, use, one of the, use the file core module in Node, and it will do that. It will bring it back to you. And when it's ready, you can respond. Go back to your user. Um, WebSockets also works in the same sort of idea. You'll have a WebSocket client. It'll come out. I'll, talk, I'll show you some more examples. And then uh, the server will eventually handle it in the event loop, and then it'll come back. The event loop does a series of things. Um, we're not going to get into it too much, but thankfully there's some other talks and there's lots of documentation online. So you can, if you really want to get into how the event loop works, plenty of information out there for you. Callback functions. This is kind of how things now work in Node. JavaScript, you're probably familiar with the callback function anyway. Uh, here's a nice little example for you. So we're going to get stuff, pass in some parameters, and then there's our callback function. So whenever you're making, uh, we'll show more examples of like the server and stuff, but whenever you're making a call to do something, uh, it'll usually respond with a callback. And then this is a convention in Node. You'll see this everywhere. Remember this, error first. So if you've got an error, you'll see that in the first param. If you don't, it'll be null. Then you'll get your results. So, so you get one or the other. If there's an error, null will, or results will be empty. If there's no error, error will be. Depends on what you're consuming, though. Because if someone builds a module where they're actually passing you additional information about the error, they could be passing that in additional params. It just depends on the module. I would say standard, yes. In fact, I think all the core do <coughs> this. It's either error or your results. Yeah, most of the time. Uh, here is a quick web, web server in, in Node. So this is a Node core module, HTTP. Pull that in. Then call its create server function. Um, these are actually separate objects that you're going to get back. This is your call, a callback again. So when it's created, I'm going to write hello world as a response. And then I'm done. 
and then there's a request so that you can actually do all your quest related. If you want to make the request, find out what, what they passed in, respond to it, there it is. Um, it's not started, it's not started yet, according to Node. That's what this is for. Now I'm saying I want to listen on this port and then another callback function. I'm ready to listen, and then the console log. Console log and node, I haven't mentioned this yet, but this is one of the ways of course you can debug. You'll get, when you run your node uh, server on your command line, you'll have a console right there. Anything you log is generally going to be output there. So you can see all your login information. So it'll, you go to your web browser, pull it up, you can see that, and then the console log you see from the node side is in that log, not on the client side. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you a little Node.js uh, sample application. In fact, it's actually live, and you can check out the code here. Let's see if I can get out of this uh, mode. In fact, let's blow this up. Here's uh, what the app looks like. It's just a simple little shopping list. So um, I could enter a few things. Um, looks like our, somebody else is also updating it. We can uh, delete one. We can edit one and update. Very simple. So let's take a look at the code. Um, now this is probably not how you want to create your code. I did this for simplicity. But it's, um, let's blow up the yeah. screen here. Everybody see that okay? Okay. It's um, on my GitHub account. So if you go to GitHub, uh, Mark Calkins, and then shopping list, shopping dash list, let me borrow that. Top one. Top one. Okay. So you'll notice here, just like Travis showed you before, you're first going to require the HTTP module. We add in a couple of other modules, um, a parse uh, URL capability that with, with the parse enabled, and also the, the file system, um, because uh, it's basically going to hit that as well. There's also a really cool uh, thing called query string, which will convert strings to objects. And then we set up a simple little uh, array, um, which is where it keeps track of all the things you've entered. Um, now here we basically set up the server with that same format, the function, uh, the callback with the request and the response. And then we use the switch method to basically handle all the four standard um, uh, HTTP uh, things like git. Down here you got a post, uh, delete. And, um, and we're, of course, we're using jQuery to handle delete, uh, AJAX methods to handle delete and put. So let me just go through this real quick. We don't spend too much time on it. But one thing you'll notice with Node, it's pretty low level. So you have to actually tell it a lot of stuff, which you won't have to do in Express, which is one of the reasons why we like Express a lot. But just to show you an example, so we put in all the body right in here. Now, you probably want to modularize this. But still, we have to basically tell it everything. Um, so we've got the CSS in there. We've got your standard HTML. And we come down here to some JavaScript. So we pull in jQuery. Uh, we pull in, and then we basically start creating the, the uh, git um, JavaScript command. This, by the way, again, is a templated, templated free example. You would probably want to use a templating engine yep. like handlebars or something like that, and then send your requests off to that, and then have your job have all your JavaScript HTML et cetera over there. And then down here, we're of course then writing it out uh, for the user so that they show it on their browser. And the uh, same thing's true then with the the other. So you know, take a look at this, peruse it at your leisure. Um, it's basically just to give you an idea of a very low level version, simple application of Node. Okay, we'll switch back now to the slides. Um, one of the things that's cool about Node is that there's a lot of modules that are available. Um, in fact, the uh, popular 
repo for node modules has got more modules than any other repo for any other programming language called NPM. The cool thing about this is that you can actually use it to uh, bring in what you need to extend and enhance your application. Um, there are three main sources. Uh, Node has quite a few of them itself. We used uh, FS and HTTP. Uh, you can also do some OS functions, for example. Um, the third party one we're going to talk about in a second is NPM. So if you go to npmjs.org, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff. Node Package Manager. And then you can create your own. And this is probably the best way to organize your code. So, if you're creating your own module, of course you put in a separate thing. In this case, we did a hello.js, just creating a simple hello function. So here is our actual function definition, just console logging out hello. And then we apply that function object to module.exports. Uh, when you're over in, back in your app, then you require in your hello module, and then call it. There's your function. You're done. Uh, one thing to note, this is a gotcha. I mentioned this up here. There's technically two things you can use in your modules. You can use exports or module exports. There is a difference. Exports is like this pre-built object that Node provides for you. So if you ever want to apply anything to exports, then you're actually going to apply it to a, uh, a subkey. So you do exports dot whatever gets this. Um, so it's not top level. And then when you require when you require that, you would it, so if we did hello dot call for instance, um, you would then we're still requiring hello and it'd be hello dot call. Um, module exports gives you that top level um, capability. So if you're actually going to be returning a fully functional object, or whether it's it's just a function you just want at the top level, use module exports. It's a big gotcha for beginners. Okay, this is the home page for NPM. Um, I looked uh, at it uh, yesterday, and it's up over 146,000 modules that are available. You can find pretty much anything. The interesting thing about NPM is it's not just for Node anymore. So you find it now, you'll find stuff for Angular, React, Backbone, um, maybe even a little bit for jQuery, although it's kind of got some of its own place. Um, you also find a lot just for regular JavaScript, but most of the modules are targeted for Node. And some of the popular ones, uh, we're going to talk about Express, we're going to talk about Socket.io. Jade is a templating language that was written by the same guy that wrote Express. That's pretty cool. Um, it's got a lot of database support now, as Travis said. Uh, Redis is your uh, in-memory database, uh, Mongo. Uh, a lot of SQL database tools. Uh, we love Mongoose because it uh, basically creates an object model for Node, uh, excuse me, for Mongo, and it's really easy to use. You can find underscore, Lodash for functional programming. Uh, async, we're going to come back to. It's a really cool tool to use in, in handling asynchronous uh, coding um, and getting around some of the problems with a asynchronous coding. And then there's a number of other ones. Okay. Socket I.O. As you mentioned before, this is about web sockets. This is about your bi-directional communication. There it is, bi-directional communication. <laughs> uh, you want to do things like instant messengers, chats, uh, IRC. Or you're, you're relying on your client side for real-time events that your server is generating. You're going to want to use WebSockets, and it's there now. Uh, 1.2 is out. Um, I've actually used it. It's fantastic. Um, in fact, here is not my application, but here is a sample application that we have. You know where? Yeah. Let me. Sh let's get out of there. So this is, if you go to the Socket.io website, they actually walk you through creating a very simple application. It's actually this one. Yeah. And, um, nope, that's not it. It is right here. All right. So here is the 
client side of things. Uh, important things, so obviously we have a lot of our uh, scaffolding. Um, that's one thing to note. That's the client side part of Sock.io. So you've got something you're going to load in on your server, something you're going to load in on your client. That's how you get your, your, your framework so you can do this communication. So um, they'll have that. You don't necessarily need to write that down. You can just go to Sock.io and they'll give you that as an example. We're also loading in jQuery. And then here's how we're setting this up on the, on the client side. So we're pulling in uh, our socket. Uh, and then um, on a form submit, we're going to send uh, our chat message, a message to that, to our server, saying, here's our chat message, take it. And then on here is another event. See the socket dot on is our event. And we're listening for chat message. And then a call back again. Here's <coughs> our message. And then we append it to our messages. So, so there should be more code. <laughs> you would think, but that's a chat server on the client side right there. One of the kind of cool things that was kind of embedded in this, you might notice, is that all we're doing is admitting when actually we send one out. So we're not even sending the chat message to our own display because we're still listening on the same channel. We'll get that same message back. So the server is still telling us, even though we sent the message, to display it. It's kind of fun. Um, the server side. Yeah, so we go up here. All right. There's your server. There's That's your chat it. Server. That's it. You're done. <laughs> you got a chat client. Uh, we also loaded an Express here. We'll talk more about Express later. Um, and then there's HTTP server. Uh, there's your there's your socket I/O right there. So we connect it up to our HTTP server. Um, That's so that we're telling it how it's going to respond. Um, that's just. That's related to um, Express. Here is the other part of I.O. So once again, we're doing an event. We get a connection request. This is pretty much saying a client is trying to connect to us. Our callback gives us a socket. Now we can do stuff with that socket, like we can listen in for a chat message, like we received from our chat client. When we get one, a message comes through. And then all we're doing is we're going to admit that to everybody else. So everybody that's connected in is going to get that same message. Yeah. <coughs> where are we looking? Where does it handle the other? I mean, this looks like it's essentially client connects. It listens for a chat message from client and sends it only to that client. It's actually not. <coughs> okay. So this is the overall I/O connection, the server connection. So it's listening on your node server for any socket connection. That can, that can be made to this server. So if you have two or more people loading in the client we saw a minute ago, and they both, are, they both will throw a connection out to your server, then your server will automatically manage that for you. You don't have to say, oh, I need to manage all my clients. No, that's, this is all you've got to do is say, after I receive a connection, here it is. The, the emit part, that's where it's saying, send it to everybody. So, Socket.io is managing all your connections. It knows what's going on. And then when you emit, everybody gets it, including yourself in this case. So this could be the one client that, this could be one client that comes in, but everybody gets a message. So it go through connection to connection. Um, when you, uh, are, are those connections name space? So for example, you can broadcast for different people. This one's more of a broadcast, but you can add that functionality yes. so you can go point to point. You can do finite connection control. How would you do that? We're not going to go over that in this topic. I would recommend <laughs> you look at Socket.io for more information about that. Oh, okay, so let's go back, go back to the app. Here. All right. So oh, hang on a second. We won't actually jump too far. Oh, did we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Express first. We want to talk about Express first. <laughs> and let's get it into full screen. <coughs> okay. Um, no, it's pretty low level. So uh, you, uh, but it allows you to do just a lot of different things. But for most of us, we're probably not going to need to dive that deep. And for me, uh, 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 Express was a uh, 
was really awesome because it makes it so much easier to write applications. Um, basically, it was written by uh, an individual who also wrote Jade, as I mentioned, uh, also uh, helped write Stylus, a very, very talented young man. Um, it's got built-in web uh, HTTP server, um, which Node already has, but it adds to it a whole bunch of request and response enhancements over and above what Node provides you. It also has this built-in view support, so it makes it really easy to use a templating language. Um, lots of different helpers. Ability to create APIs very easily, very quickly. And it's uh, very strong with its router, especially the new the version that came out this last summer, Express 4. And in fact, if you haven't played with Express, don't look at anything else other than 4 and above. Uh, the other cool thing, though, is if you really do need to dive deep and do something that's not built into Express, you can still go straight to Node. It doesn't block anything, so it's great. Uh, you saw in the chat we, had, we pulled in, uh, up Express, but here's another example with just Express. So requiring an Express, uh, we actually call Express to generate our, our app. These are route calls. So we're expecting a git on anything uh, or the root, you know, our root path. And so then we have our callback and we're going to render the index page. So now we're getting into the templating side of things. By default, um, as you mentioned, Jade is actually the default templating structure for Node. Uh, I mean, for Express, sorry. But you can, of course, implement anything you want. I actually really like Handlebar, so I've used that before a lot. Um, another thing we're doing here is we're saying that anything else that doesn't look like any other request, that's what the star is, uh, it's not found. So, sorry, we don't know where you're coming from. So you can do all of your sort of error handling. Um, we have a more comprehensive uh, example here. And then at the end, you're still doing a listen. So this is just like an HTTP server. We're listening on 3000 again. It's still a callback. So yep, we're up and running, and our, our log tells us that when we're doing our development. One of the very cool things about Express is this concept of middleware. This allows you to basically look at any request, and before it gets handled, you can actually have all kinds of different things uh, looking at that request message. Uh, so it's great for authentication if you've got an app that the user needs to log into. You can authenticate them first. Uh, you can do logging, you can do uh, cookie session, uh, and very ty various types of session management. Um, so it's great. And you simply set up your middleware and when the request comes in, you do whatever it needs to do, then you go to the next, then it handles the next. So you can actually have a whole stack of different middleware before it actually gets uh, the response is handled. As we talked about, there's various view engines. Uh, there's actually a couple that are built in. So Jade's one, um, EJS is another, also Mustache. For handlebars and swigs, pretty easy to support. All you gotta do is add a module which you can get up on NPM, and then you can use your favorite, there, and you can even just use native HTML as well. Okay, now we have a, um, a little more comprehensive application here. Uh, we'll probably spend uh, a few minutes on this one since we've got some time. Um, I don't have this up and running, but you actually can go look at the code. And in fact, what I may do first is show you the uh, how to get this app started, and then we'll show you what it looks like. Blow this guy up. That should be good. Everyone can see that okay? Yeah. Whoops, I gotta do this everywhere. <laughs> okay, so first of all, what I'm gonna do is actually start the uh, Mongo server. So that's up and running. And then I am going to simply start my node server. Now I'm using a to tool that you, if you're going to do any node work, you're going to want to use this tool called Node Mon. Actually, I like to call it Node Demon because when you look at the site, it's got a kind of looks like a devil. Um, 
So Node Daemon, a great tool because if you're doing any development, anytime you change any code, it will automatically reload the server for you. So it's great for testing and debugging. And so is let's get... with Node or is that something... No, that's separate. That's separate. If you just go to, just do a Google search on uh, Nodemon and you'll find it. Okay, so now we're listening to port 3000. So let's go take a quick look at this. Let's reload um, it. Okay, there we go. So this is the app. I'm kind of a front end guy. I'm not much of a back end developer, but Node's allowed me to start doing some back end stuff. So it's. Um, kind of laid out like this. So we're using Node Express, we're also using Mongoose as well as Mongo for this application. So it's kind of a nice one to take a quick look at because it'll help you get an idea how to set up working with some of these different tools. Um, part of the page, uh, and when you actually do a pull request or download it, you can actually, the database is also included with that. So it'll kind of walk you through what we're using, how we've used it, uh, this, pa uh, this project page is kind of nice because it tells you um, what each of the JavaScript files actually do. And we'll walk you through some of those in just a second. Um, there's also a, uh, and then I created a bunch of blogs just to talk about various topics related to Node. Uh, down here in the bottom left is this thing called Blog Manager. And what this does is allow the uh, the first couple of pages you saw were just static Jade files, but uh, we have the ability to quickly add in any blogs, and so I can create a new one. Or I can, uh, now when you first go into this, you'll need to log in, create a username and all that stuff. This is all authenticated. I can then go into any one of these and um, add a title. The title is, is then used as a slug. Uh, there's a little tool to slugify the title. Um, and you can add tags and, and the, the date actually gets created automatically based on when you first did this. Uh, I didn't uh, uh, put any uh, templating here, so it's just raw HTML, so you may want to actually do it in your editor and then drop it in. But just to give you an idea. Okay, so let's go look at the code. Here we are right here. Okay, you see that okay? Okay, so let's look at the main file first. We're actually using quite a few modules and this will be fairly common. Um, yeah, let me borrow the thank you. So we've got, at the very beginning, we've got Express and you can actually do this in a single line if you choose. Um, there's a number of other tools. I won't talk about all of these. Uh, these are different modules that I'm using. Um, I've also created my own routes. And so these are, um, as Travis talked about, uh, the way to bring in a module is to simply require it. And so these are modules that we've created. And then we're using a, a, a few other things as well that are pretty cool. Uh, there's a couple that I wanted to point out um, body parser, anytime you're dealing with any, any uh, information that you're going to display on a page, you're going to want to use body parser. And then method override is really cool. Instead of having to use AJAX calls to do deletes and puts, you can basically fake it out and you don't have to use any, any jQuery or, or, a, or just straight AJAX. Okay, we set up the environment. Um, this allows you to switch back and forth between a development mode and a production mode. We set up our uh, view engine. we tell it where we want it to go. We also have a, little, a couple little helper files that do some interesting things. And um, we also set up locations of some other directories in our program um, hierarchy so it knows where to look for things. Public is used for all of your uh, CSS files, your JavaScript files, and your images, and it knows where to find your favicon, as well as, uh, and I'm also using Foundation, which is a CSS framework uh, in this thing. Um, and then there's, uh, here's the middleware that we're using. 
So, and then here's how, here's the use of met, method override so that we can basically, um, basically do puts and deletes with standard HTTP calls. And so that's um, just something I pulled off the method override uh, site. And, um, and then down here are all the routes. So this is where, now you might want to set up all this routing in another module. I just put them in here for simplicity. But uh, if the application got bigger and bigger and bigger, you'd want to start modularizing your code so probably, you know probably we did, more. we did do is that we took all our callbacks and those, those require as we pulled in those different route files, that's where we actually defined all our callbacks. So instead of having a mess of callback functionality in here to handle each one of these routes, then we just do a simple little pass the function in here, this is going to handle this. And then, you know, if you need to make changes to it, go to that. Go to yeah, that. so we'll show, you, we'll show you a couple of these in a minute. But all you do basically is your, uh, you know, you define your HTTP call here, gets, posts, puts, and deletes, and you define the route, and then uh, in a couple of cases you have to be authenticated. That's this, where this middleware comes in. And then you basically um, point it to where you want it to go. So let's go take a look at just one of these um, routes. I've got those in the routes folder. And let's just take a look at blogs. So now it also requires some things. So it, um, it basically pulls in some database information. But then we use the exports and define the, define the function, uh, the module. And um, that then becomes available once we require it back into the main application. And this one is basically a, a module to basically find the blog that we're looking for. And then down here we export, do a couple of exports. Remember what I mentioned about exports? If you use exports, put it on one of the sub things. So he's doing exports tools, exports the sub keys, sub, uh, exports project, etc. He's not actually creating his own module, so he's not using module exports. Yes. Let's go look at. Um, another part of the app. Not doing real well here. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the models. Now this is um, this is uh, Mongoose and it is incredibly simple to set up a schema using Mongoose. Uh, if you know anything about JSON, as, as uh, Travis said, um, MongoDB is pretty much a JSON database and it's very easy to extend and add to it later on. Uh, basically defining your schema is pretty simple. You just say, okay, here's one of the uh, items in the collection, what type it is, uh, some parameters, and we're defining the slug as the URL extension, the body, and the date that it was created and modified. Just a quick cool note. If you wanted to modify that scheme and add another column, all you do is, do is add another thing into that definition, and it's supported. Yeah, automatically. So you can There's easily no extend and yeah, you don't have to figure worry about rearranging all your SQL. That's the cool thing about Mongo. We also then have a little uh, tool here to um, basically create a slug based on the title, and then here's where we're using module exports. So we wanted to show you kind of an example of using exports. We're seeing using Mongo, oh, excuse me, module exports. In um, just a couple other things I'll point out and then we'll, uh, we'll go on. In the lib area is where we basically set up the database. So this is what actually talks to Mongo, uh, Mongo through Mongoose. We also have a um, uh, let's show you the views just for fun. Uh, you may not be familiar with Jade, but um, the cool thing about um, Express and Node is that it will automatically compile stuff on the fly for you. And uh, let's take a look at like the main one. The other thing that's nice about Jade is that it's very much like web components with HTML extends where you can actually modularize your HTML. So you can create like the header and footer put that in one Jade file, and then you simply bring it in when you need it. Uh, that's the layouts Jade file. So we just did an extends layout, 
And in there, we defined, okay, where the content actually goes in the layout file, and then we put in, in each one of the pages, we don't have to replicate that code everywhere. Very outline-ish. So it's really nice. It's very, if, you're, if you're familiar with Python, it's very similar. It uses an indent model so that um, that's how you simply define things. So it's pretty simple. Um, takes a little while to get used to it, but uh, I actually like it a lot. I don't. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, it really depends on your personal taste. Yes. Okay, so, um, and there's a, there's a readme on it. So if you do want to pull it, and then play around with it. Um, all the information's there to help you get started. All right, let's jump back into the presentation. We're almost out of time. We don't want to slow you down from lunch. <laughs> all right, so we've been talking callback, callback, callback. Uh, there's a challenge here. <laughs> if you start using callbacks and nesting callbacks and nesting callbacks, then you go into what has been affectionately called callback hell. I have done this many times, sadly. Uh, when I was starting learning Node and whatever, I actually decided, uh, let's create a MUD in Node, because if you want to learn a language or something, just create a MUD in it, because you have to do just about everything. Um, so I started playing with Socket.io, I started playing with Express and Node and everything, and then I started creating my own little, of course, um, game engine, and started doing callbacks, because that's what we're doing, right? And then I started nesting callbacks, and nesting callbacks, and nesting callbacks. And I actually, I think my latest one is actually broken and is doing like some sort of recursive loop because I'm calling a callback that I made way up there again. And so it just keeps going down and down and down. Don't do this, <laughs> ever. Simple callbacks are fine. There are ways to solve this though. If you're, if you're <coughs> dealing with this, if you have this, you're getting into your code and you're like, oh, I need to, I need to do another callback and then callback. Instead of just starting to nest things like crazy, uh, async budgets. There's a series of, of helper uh, functions. As the name implies, it's dealing with asynchronous stuff. But you can, like parallel is a good example of one that I could do off the top of my head, where you can just uh, call a number of, of functions parallel. There's also like series where you can call functions in series. So the idea there is that you still have these separate calls, and then it handles looping over things for you. Instead of doing all your callbacks, but it'll do it in order. Uh, promises, anyone that's heard of promises, they're fantastic and confusing at times, um, but a really great way to chain your function calls instead of uh, doing the best callback structure. Generators, uh, another cool and up and coming thing with um, XScript 6 is the idea of generators. The idea here would be that you have your uh, function, and then if you know anything about generators, the idea, if, if you've ever heard of coroutines, you might have seen this in C Sharp, et cetera, as well. But the idea is, is that you kind of yield processing control to something else. So you create a function, and then you say yield, it's a keyword, and then to something else, a function, and then it waits for it to return, and then comes back and continues your processing. So the idea here is you create your function, you yield to something that you need to wait on that's doing something else that may take forever or whatever, it'll come back later, and then you can do the next thing, and so on and so forth. One of the interesting things about um, Node is you can actually start using ECMAScript 6 stuff right now. You don't have to worry about browser compatibility. So you can start using promises and generators today because both are supported in the current version of Node. Just a quick note, we didn't really talk about Koa because we are talking about Express. Koa is another type of framework like Express, um, and they have built-in generator support. Um, and then there's this article that you can go view, to, uh, view on your own. We just have a link to it here that talks about other solutions even. Do you find uh, yourself using a combination of all these solutions? Yeah, it kind of really depends yeah. on what you're dealing with. So what your, what your context is. So this looks right for you, but Stay out of callback hell, please. <laughs> yeah, the future is, future is probably a combination of promises and generators. Okay. Um, uh, because uh, there's just a lot of stuff being available for Node, there's also a lot of great testing tools as well. Now, some of those are built in. Uh, two that are built in is a Node debugger. Now, what this does is it puts a client on the, on the uh, Chrome V8 engine. Uh, there's also an assert tool that allows you to start testing stuff. Say that again, what you think the debugger puts a client, I mean a client 
uh, there's a, basically a, an easy way to get access to the V8 um, debugger, and they have a little tool that makes that available. If it's still running in your server side test code. Yeah, yeah. Checking out docs. Now, the, the, um, the assert tool that comes with Node probably isn't the best. There's a couple of others that you'll probably want to consider um, instead. A, an, an easy one that's got everything built into it is, is Jasmine. It's, um, it's got your framework as well as your assert libraries. And it's pretty easy to set up. Not quite as flexible, however, than one that's probably even more popular called Mocha. Mocha takes a little while to get set up and running, but it's uh, much more powerful and has a lot more options. This is something we're also looking in our single page apps. Um, with Mocha, you will have to pick an assert library. There's a number of them that are available. Probably the most popular is called Chai. And um, that's probably one you want to take a quick look at. And then also Karma, which can be used really with any, any JavaScript code, is a great test runner to uh, basically set up and then automatically run your tests. Um. I just wanted to add this in here because I wanted to talk about some of the cool things people are doing with Node. So this is a project that's going on called NodeBots. Uh, the idea is you're running robots and all of your logic and everything is done in JavaScript. And it's using Node. It is amazing. Um, there is a framework, there's actually a couple now. One's called the Johnny Five framework, for those that get the reference. <laughs> and then another great reference, there's Cylon.js. Fantastic little projects going on for uh, interacting with electrical, electronic components and robots. And uh, I also recommend just searching for things out there because there's some really cool talks out there on the web about people that are building robots, but they're doing it in JavaScript and they're doing it in production type uh, situations. Really, really cool. Uh, there's just one or two more things we wanted to mention. Uh, you probably, how many have heard of io.js? Uh, this actually came out last year and people were really concerned when it got announced. Because what this was, was a fork of Node and it's like, oh great, it's all we need is a fork. But part of the problem was that Node at the time was being managed completely by a company called Joyent. And uh, Joyent is uh, where Ryan Dahl, the guy who invented Node, works. Uh, and they were pretty concerned with uh, the governance of Node. So they forked it, went off, and they've been adding features a lot faster than Node has. Now the good thing is that at the Fluent conference in March, um, the CEO of Joyent got up and basically announced that they were going to hand off the management and governance of Node to a independent group. That group is really just getting started. But I think you're going to long term going to potentially see these two come back together. And um, hopefully it'll get all of this uh, resolved. But I think they've been successful in the fact that they got Joyent to spin this off. Um, so if you hear anything about io.js, that's what it's all about. Don't worry about it too much. I would focus more on Node because I think that's where uh, everything's going to be work, uh, focused on, but I think it had uh, great value in getting Joyent to, to make this more independent. Uh, I think this is one of our last slides. Yep. So we have a lot of resources that we've uh, come across, and so we just wanted to throw up here a bunch of links for you guys to look at in the slides. Uh, a couple that I've really enjoyed, uh, Node School, NodeSchool.io. Um, it has a very interesting framework for, for teaching you about topics like Node, JavaScript, etc. They call them workshoppers. And essentially, there's almost like these self-contained um, uh, packages that you download, you run, and then it's interactive tutorial. So you'll come up with lesson one, it'll say, do this. And then you can actually run the package and say, verify me, and say, yep, you did it. Move on to the next one. Or, nope, you didn't do it, try again. I'll give you some hints. Fantastic. Um, another one is uh, Node Weekly. So I actually just recently signed up for this one. So they send a, a kind of an article, what's going on in Node type thing through your email. They have archives, tons of useful resources. That's actually where I found out about Cylon.js. I knew about Johnny Five, but um, that's why I wanted to bring that up as well. 
Uh, JS books, free ebooks for JavaScript, lots of JavaScript topics, and those in there too. So, um, we didn't leave a whole lot of time for questions. Um, apologize for that. Uh, feel free to come up afterwards. We don't want to keep you from lunch. But our uh, slides are available here. And you can also provide feedback uh, to help us make do better next time. Thanks. Okay.